Uh, and again, these classes are really uh, opportunities for yourself to come and to say, look, I got a game I had an issue with, could you just go over it? And the first game lasted so long because basically I had to fish very hard to get a second score sheet here. Thanks to Julian for coming to the rescue. Where's my glasses? Okay. So Julian, uh, give us the story. What's the, what's the story of this game? When did you play it? Who's who? What? What? The ninth tournament here at the club, yeah. Excellent, strong master player. You're breaking into the expert ranks. Uh, so, okay, so you're you're you're, you're facing a, an opponent who's several hundred points higher rated than you. What was the result of the game? You don't have the whole game. Okay. Kudos all around. Nice to make a draw against a, a much higher ranked player, and nice to be on the sunny side of it. You know, <laughs> it wasn't like you just snuck in at the very end and just managed to save your batus. Okay, Julian with white, knight f3. Uh, reasonable opening move, c5. e4. It's very interesting in the top level chess. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of the top 10, top 20 of the world. Vladimir Kramnik has been playing knight f3 as a near religion uh, on move one with the idea of playing c4, d4, g3 on move two, depending upon how he plays, uh, uh, his mood. A lot of e4 players uh, like to play against all kinds of defenses, especially and including the Sicilian, they don't really like playing against e5. e4, e5, it's a tough nut to crack, and um, well, e4, e5 is just not bringing white a great deal of success. So I, I, I noticed that in the top levels, a lot of players are adopting Kramnik's move knight f3. And when their opponents play a move like c5, for example, Alexander Grishuk uh, likes to play c5, knight c6, and e5 in that move order, uh, one, two, three. Uh, players change and play e4, and it's their way of getting the open Sicilian. So congratulations on setting the fashion trend for the Magnus Carlsons of the world, really. <laughs> e4, e6, great. d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight c6. Now the Paulson Sicilian, which can transpose to lots of other variations, shevenigans and what have you. I happen to think that the Paulson Sicilian, this move order for black, is actually a very, very good uh, variation of the Sicilian, and it's really not played that often. It seems like everybody and his brother likes to play the Nidor. They like to play the Dragon. They like to play other forms of the Sicilian, but if you take a look, for example, about uh, Judith Polgar, uh, the greatest female chess player ever in the history. She basically played it her whole life. She came into the world's top ten. Uh, a lot of players, when they were playing Ju uh, Judith, knew that she was going to play this p particular position, prepared like hell for her, and ended up losing. <laughs> so it kind of goes to show that uh, this uh, specific uh, variation should not be underrated. Uh, today, I would say Alexander Morozevich, Peter Svidler, and others uh, are adopting this system. And I remember, of course, the famous Kasparov, Karpov Kasparov m games with knight b5, d6, c4, knight f6, knight c3, uh, a6, knight a3, going for a kind of uh, Maroxi bind. Uh, hedgehog position. And then Gasparov shot out with his d5 move in a world championship match. 
and probably won one of the greatest games ever played with the black side. So again, this system with knight c6 and e6 deserves a lot more attention than it gets, and I'm not too sure why. Uh, I've played it with black, and I've done pretty well. Uh, knight c6, Julian came up with bishop e2. Huh. Uh, OK. Uh, essentially, um, in this position, the main moves are knight c3 and c4. Bishop e2 is not uh, one of the main moves. So after bishop e2, it's almost 100% for sure that you've thrown away any uh, white opening advantage that you might have had. And your opponent can punish your move order by playing knight f6, saying, gift me your pawn. And you have to decide what you're going to do. The first thing that you have to recognize is that knight c6, uh, bc6, e5 loses a pawn. I've lost this pawn as white many, many times. To, to knight takes c6, b takes c6, e5 loses a pawn, and I've lost the pawn as white many times to queen a5 check, <laughs> followed by queen takes e5. It's like, no! I've only done that four times. <laughs> when am I going to remember not to lose my pawn? So you can't play a line with e5 because queen a5 check is going to cost you. If you defend the pawn with knight c3, which would kind of be a normal uh, uh, defense, now comes bishop b4. Now you've got the same problem. I want to play uh, knight takes e4. Now in this position, it's quite true that you can play e5, but maybe you're not so very happy. There's a, there's a pin here that's rather annoying. Also, the knight could go here as well, just equally. And the queen on a5, and uh, white's already in chess parlance, sees the defensive. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'll put it to you, Julian. How did you intend to meet knight f6? So you wrong-footed you a little. Yeah? And then in this position? Well, f3 does encourage black to start thinking in terms of bishop c5 or queen b6, uh, controlling and uh, this diagonal. and. And if your bishop was on f1 at this position, one of the moves you would probably consider is bishop d3. Now that your bishop's on e2, you're kind of scratching your butt thinking, here's how point did I put my bishop on e2? Maybe I should put my... Okay, so then like knight d2, e5. So now it kind of looks a little bit like a French defense where e you know, you're a little bit wrong-footed here. You know, you're in a French defense with a pawn on e5. Normally speaking, your bishop might be on d3. Here, your pawn's on e5. Black has ideas. Uh, you know, if you go, pardon me, I should have put the knight on f3. But the idea is to trade bishops when he can go queen a5 check. And, so black is actually doing pretty, pretty good. Uh, main, main, main line. Just a second, just a second. Here in this position, uh, main line, where are we? Uh, that you're probably aware is knight b5, knight f6. Mm-hmm. Now, bishop f4 is not anything special. 
Uh, knight d6 check just loses a pawn after trades a knight e4. So knight, e knight here is the main move. Bishop here is the main move, yeah? So the main line for, for white is a3. Bishop takes knight, knight takes. d5, pawn takes, pawn takes. And black gives up the two bishops, accepts an isolated uh, pawn. Uh, normal move is bishop d3. Normal move is castles. Castles. And normal move is e5. Okay. So, for example, Judith, uh, not Judith Polgar, but Susan Polgar has probably played this position ten times or more in tournament games, and she's happy with black's free play, yeah? So again, you know, you compare this main line position that's been played umpteen times uh, versus your bishop e2, and you're really getting the feeling that uh, you slipped uh, as early as move four. Okay, here, here, here. Here, 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 oops, disappear, bishop e2. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little surprised your opponent, who's very experienced master, didn't jump on you with knight f6, but instead played a move that uh, fits in, pardon me? Yeah, uh, fits into a lot of Pauls and Sicilians. He plays the move queen c7. One of the ideas behind this move, queen c7, is black sometimes captures this knight, and after the queen has recaptured, he wants, provided that his g7 pawn doesn't hang, he wants to play bishop c5 and win a tempo. Here, it just so happens that knight f6 is a much superior move to queen c7. So c4, probably a question mark. Probably it's time for you to get out of dodge very quickly here. After c4, knight f6, you're in trouble again. Knight c3, bishop b4. Uh, okay, your opponent erred. Okay, your opponent uh, let you slip off the hook, so to speak. Uh, he's supposed to capture, capture, and play bishop here when, again, if you look at the theory of uh, this line, and again, so many, so many games. Black is already considered to be not just okay, but he's gone from okay to being more than okay. <laughs> like this position is actually considered uh, dangerous for you. So uh, obviously your queen's attacked, and you've got to decide: d3, d2, d1. All uh, you can make. Um, uh, an argument for all, all of these moves. So, for example, if you play queen d3 here, from black's point of view, um, this is good, this is good, this is bad, must do something about this. So black oftentimes plays b6 and bishop b7, to try to tie you down. The trade of knights has meant that sometimes the queen can actually step to e5, and it's not so easy for you to boot it out of the e5. Like if you had a knight, it'd be nice, but without the knight, the queen can take up the central square. You have to decide, well, what exactly is my queen doing on d3? Like. Does it mean I should move to g3? Like attack, attacks f2 with knight, queen, and the bishop, and it would be nice to have queen defending it. Yeah, well, uh, many oh, times, nice. yeah, yeah, many times, uh, black does play this move h5, so he can play knight g4. And as you just pointed out, correctly so, that with the combination of the bishop, queen, knight, that that looks pretty good. The other deeper question that you might have is, you've got this bishop on e2. 
how effective is that bishop? Like, in other words, where is it going that's going to scare the bejesus out of black? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Right, and especially if you can get an F4, G4, G5, Bishop F3. Oh, it all makes perfect sense, and I agree with you. It only, it's, it's just the specifics of the position that uh, your E4 pawn is an issue, yeah? And you're having to deal with this E4 pawn. So in this position, if you castle Bishop B7, uh, again, you're thinking to yourself, well, where is my light square bishop? What is it doing that's really good? And a lot, a lot of times, if you get a position where your bishop comes to g5, it's not the biggest threat in the world for you to threaten to, take, to capture the knight and double the pawns. It's not like black is especially concerned. So already, uh, the Paulson, Sicilian, Black is uh, supposed to be taking on d4 and playing bishop c5, right? The fact that you've just allowed him to do exactly that makes it very, very shocking to me that, uh, that uh, um, yeah, that, that black played bishop b4 when this um, gain of a tempo for free plays itself, right? Like just develop your pieces with gain of tempo. Knight takes to So bishop b4, question mark. Now you seize this moment to play knight b5. Very good. And uh, this totally changes the position because now after a3, the bishop went back and now it's you, you're in the driver's seat, so you can play moves like bishop e3. Mm. So in this position, you write that you have castled and that black has played knight f6. So uh, black played something else than knight f6. So let's assume that black played a6 and you played knight d4. Yeah, it's okay. I'll do my best to castles. Bishop e3. So you get uh, a standard Morosi bind slash hedgehog position, except maybe this knight on c6 is a little bit misplaced at the moment. Uh, and then indeed it is. Okay, you have played f3, and that's a kind of a, a shame. Uh, Yeah, you play you you got b4 in here, so so you have played b4. Yeah, so you got in b4 now, and it looks like he's played bishop d7 and rook e8, which are bad moves. And you've moved your queen to d2 and your rook on d1, and then you had a a very nice bind. In this exact position, it's funny. But your whole idea of bishop e2, which wasn't good, is actually suddenly, you know, like a peacock. And what you should have done is you should have just killed him. Like, you should have just gone g4 and g5. And just, <laughs> like, like, nail him to a cross. That's it. Like, uh, because the bishop on e2 is actually, in this position, very, very finely placed to just go uh, and get him. Let's say black plays a move, rook e8. Not a good move, not a bad move. I'm just, uh, as a demonstration of the type of uh, killer attack you want. You just, just go ahead and kill him. Right? Like he's, he's misplaced his pieces and your next moves are moves like f5, g6. You're just mangling him here. Uh, b5 never works because the bishop is ideal and the queen, everything is very passive, so you're just going talk, 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 yeah? So 
if he plays in this position another move, let's say, what else? What's another move? Knight d4, bishop d4, e5, bishop e3. You're just c cementing your control over squares, yeah? Nothing, nothing happened there. Again, b5 is really too slow. You're going to play g5 and win a pawn. Thank you for coming. So I think g4 is just a knockout blow here. He's already in deep trouble. Uh, b4 is wrong. b4 is wrong. Uh, all you've done with this move is weaken your knight. Um, um, bishop e3, b4 is wrong. Uh, bishop d7, that's wrong. <laughs> Put, yeah, yeah, putting your, uh, that's not where you, where you need your bishop to be. Um, after this move b4, um, I start to think of like how could I util, okay. So let's, let's make an obviously good move, rook d8. Uh, in many, many cases in hedgehogs, you need to vacate the f8 square, either for your bishop or sometimes for your knight. But rook d8 in this particular case, basically what I'm saying to you, I'm telegraphing my move. I want to break with d5. Yeah, OK, bishop f3. Now. Why do you regret playing the move b4? Don't you like pawns? I like pawns, man. The, the, the pawn on c4, you made the pawn, you made the pawn on c4 vulnerable by playing the move b4. So you're just encouraging me to play knight e5 and gift me the pawn. <laughs> Give me the pawn. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, for Black, that's a big success, considering that you know he was just uh, facing uh, sudden death with G4. Okay, so more or less, you kind of just came to a position that went Bishop D7, Queen D2, Rook E8, Rook on F1 or D1, Rook on F to D1, B6. King h1, f3, king h1, deep, deep, you know, modern chess. <laughs> Tucking your king away. Queen b7. Now, black obviously uh, suffers from the fact that he doesn't understand that it's the bishop that wants to be on b7, <laughs> and it's the knight on c6 that wants to be on d7. So here, what ha what's happened is you have a nice, comfortable edge in space. Uh, you've got uh, control literally of the center as well as the queen side, and I think you have a considerable advantage. OK. Excellent. You took on c6, he took with the bishop, and b5. Aha, so your idea was to target this fellow. Yeah. And that was pretty good. Ooh, so you really were winning at that point. Yeah, like that, like that, 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 that's a real, take out. So he's, he did uh, quite a number of things uh, that were wrong. And if we go back to this moment, uh, hedgehogs can be terrible. It's really worth studying hedgehogs because I think they're, they're a variation that uh, if you understand them well, you can score a lot of points with both both colors, and your guide will be Ulf Anderson. Ulf Anderson loved to play the hedgehog, and he did it extraordinarily well. And uh, Ulfi, in this position, he would have played against you knight e5, yeah? And so his idea would be to put
pressure on you on your C4 pawn. And his idea is he wants to incur, he wants to coax you, bait you, if you will, into playing F4 because he reckons that he has to initiate action very, very quickly before you get an overwhelming position like what you got, right? And if you don't play F4, then he's going to play Rook C8 and he's going to cause you, well, at least to get a little bit defensive minded, yeah? But I strongly uh, uh, encourage people to study the hedgehog from both the white and black side and really it's going to be worth points to you one day. Uh, trust me on that one. And I actually like to play both sides of the hedgehog. It was like one of those variations that, well, excuse me for patting myself on the back, but I played really well. And one of my finest wins ever is I was playing uh, Grandmaster Jan Timon, and at the time, Jan Timon's playing for the World Championship with Anatoly Karpov. I was black in a hedgehog, and I took him out cold. Like, that was just like, like this is one of those games where it's the total crush. <laughs> you know, this was the 28 to nothing, everybody's happy kind of game. But I used all of the motifs that are uh, common in hedgehogs and um, got him really, really nicely. But um, there, was, there was some serious uh, uh, errors going back and forth in that first half dozen moves as you both were just kind of unaware of the opportunities. He, he plays the dragon like every game. Against you, he just said, yeah, you prepared. If you play E4. Yeah, we had a week to prepare. Oh, wow. OK, yeah. And I once got crushed myself. I was on the on uh, the wrong side. I was wrong-footed, just in that position that you could have had, that your opponent could have achieved against you, uh, Julian. Uh, my opponent, my, uh, Tony Miles, achieved a position like this against me. I was on the white side of such a position where uh, I, I got somehow, somehow my, my pawns were, I had space, but it was like they were fixed. The, my, my pawns were rigid. And when the bishop came to b7, there was a shocking move. I think I was castled. OK, so let's just say, uh, let's say a6, let's say castles. And something very bad happened like b6, let's say king h1, and let's say uh, bishop b7. So something very bad happened to me. I got a position like this, very similar to this, and I didn't think I was doing so bad. Like, I was doing OK. And then there was this really bad move that happened to me. It was like I, I got hit with something that I couldn't do much against this threat. Like in this particular position, we can all see, yeah, exactly, where, you know, or, or, or maybe it was like queen e5, and he got in g5 as well, oh. right? And I had, and you know, I got a position where the, the, like suddenly, the, yeah, yeah, the queen was like on e5, and it was like in the middle of the board, and suddenly there was like this bishop d6 was coming, and God knows maybe I ended up with like a, like a bishop on g1, and he had total domination of all of the dark swords, and it was like, uh, it was nightmarish. <laughs> I lost uh, a game, but boy, did I learn a very valuable lesson. And I was really, in, even in this moment, I was over... Uh, appreciating my own control of the center. When it was like his pieces were like crawling all over me, you know, like, ah, you know. So it was a good lesson. And this knight d4, bishop c5 is a, is a, is a nice one. Well, thank you all for coming to these evening's lectures. Mm -hmm.